Have you ever wondered how Game Genie codes work? How exactly do you go from this to this just by entering these set of letters? If you grew up with the NES, or even if you didn't, and only discovered retro gaming through emulation, you probably know what cheat codes are. These are codes that can be entered into most emulators. These codes allow the player to cheat in games in many different ways. Some examples would be infinite lives, invincibility, level skipping, high jumps, just to name a few. But there are many different use cases. My fondest memory of a Game Genie cheat code was enabling blood in the Super NES version of Mortal Kombat that was infamously censored by Nintendo. Instead of blood, the game was changed to sweat. But by adding in a Game Genie cheat code that modified the color palette of the sweat to red, it mostly worked. Most modern emulators out there have pre-built codes for games that you can select for ease of use. The origins of these cheat codes go all the way back to the early 80s. In the early days, it was possible just to modify addresses in memory with poke commands. And this was done on early 8-bit computers such as the Commodore 64 by using what was known as freezer cartridges. By playing the game and then freezing the contents of memory, the contents of memory could be examined and modified. This would also include the ROM address space. And while cheat cartridges existed on home computers long before the NES, the Game Genie was the original cheat device for a home console. Developed by Codemasters and released in 1990, the Game Genie was advertised as a video game enhancer, which I can only assume was for legal reasons. The way the Game Genie works is pretty simple from a high level. The cartridge sits between the game ROM and the console and acts sort of like a man in the middle. Given the specific Game Genie code that's been entered, this code translates to a memory location and a data value. The device works by intercepting the CPU reads and replacing the game cart's response with its own, based on that memory location that was provided. So for example, if you know the memory location for the number of lives in Super Mario Bros. 1 and you know it to be the value of 3, the Game Genie can intercept the code that decreases the number of lives when you die to perform a different operation. But the topic of this video are these codes. What are these letter codes that just seem to be a bunch of random letters? What do the codes mean? And how do they even translate to something an NES would understand? The numbers, basically. What do they mean? In the past, I've tried to follow along with how Game Genie codes work, and I just got confused. But I've spent a bit of time to finally understand how it all works. And we're going to explain it here as simply as possible. So let's start with a simple example. Back in the day, if you owned a Game Genie, many codes were easy to memorize. And one of the codes that I always go back to is SXIOPO, which provides infinite lives for Super Mario Brothers. First, we said that each Game Genie code contains a memory location where the Game Genie will intercept and a data value with what will be patched in. We can think of it this way. If we can identify where the code lives to decrease the number of lives in Super Mario World when Mario loses a life, we can provide code to replace that call to do something else so that no lives are ever lost. This is important to understand that the Game Genie code affects the game program itself in ROM, not the RAM. The Game Genie only ever works with the ROM data and by adjusting how the ROM affects the values stored in RAM is the key to using this device. Game Genie codes are either 6 or 8 characters long, but for this example we're going to keep it simple for now and just focus on the 6 character codes. Each letter in a Game Genie code corresponds to a certain hex value as shown in this list below. So if we take our example for SXIOPO, we get the following hex values. Hexadecimal D, A, 5, 9, 1, and 9. Now let's convert these to a binary representation. Now I don't know binary offhand, but using a calculator, we can see this. The NES is a 8-bit console with a 6502 processor and can address 16 bits of memory space. So if we take a look at this 6-digit code with the binary representation, we know that 16 bits of this binary data must refer to the address, while the other 8 bits maps to the data value. So which of these map to the memory and which map to the data values? Well, once again, this is encoded and you can't just extract them by reading the bits from right to left. Instead, the following code is used to extract the address. Now this does look quite complex, but let's break it down. If we take N3, which is 1001, and AND it with 7, which is binary 0111, we get the result 0001. Then we shift this 12 bits to the left. 
And we do the same for N5 by aiming it by seven and shifting it eight bits to the left. We do the same for N4, aiming it by eight and shifting it eight bits to the left. The same for N2, aiming it by seven and shifting it four bits to the left. The same for N1, aiming it by eight, shifting it four bits to the left. And the same again for N4, aiming it by seven. And then finally, N3, aiming it by eight. So once these calculations are done, these are all the binary values that are represented in each of these conditions. Now what we do is we all all these values together. When we all these values together, we get the hexadecimal value 11D9. And the last step is just to add hexadecimal 8000, which is the beginning of where the program ROM lives on the NES. The final address would be 91D9. So if we use a debugger in an NES emulator like FCEUX and locate memory address 91D9, we can see that the value being displayed is hexadecimal CE. It turns out that this data value is nothing more than a 6502 opcode that's telling the game what it needs to do next. And in this instance, CE is performing a decrement of whatever is in the memory location 075A. We can test this with an emulator and a debugger by setting a breakpoint on address 91D9. And we can see when Mario loses a life, this breakpoint gets hit. And we can see that this value is being decreased. We can quite easily adjust the value at hexadecimal 75A by giving it 99 lives or hexadecimal 63. But the Game Genie code, as we said, doesn't directly modify the contents of RAM. It only works with ROM. And this is where the second part comes in, which is the data value. The data value effectively replaces the opcode with something else. For example, we could decrement another memory location that's not used, or we could even swap out the decrement opcode with an increment opcode, which would increase the number of lives by one each time Mario loses one. But before we get too ahead of ourselves, let's go back to the Game Genie code SXIOPO to see what that data value is. Now this is the code that will extract the data value. It's very similar to how the address values are being extracted. And if we take the result in binary, we get 01011101, which translates to hexadecimal AD. So this now is performing what is known as a LDA or load into the accumulator opcode. This is a register of the 6502 that's used to store byte values in. But the code is telling us here that rather than decrease the number of lives, just load the accumulator with the number of lives, which in effect isn't really doing anything because the accumulator register is being constantly loaded and stored from, so the number of lives will always remain constant. We could also swap out the opcode to increment the number of lives by changing AD to EE, which is the 6502 hex value for ink or increment by one. As you can see, this adds one to the number of lives each time Mario loses one. And you can see that the representation of the Game Genie code, while it's similar, is still different to the SXIOPO. This is important because Codemasters not only purposely obfuscated Game Genie codes, they designed the device to be very user-friendly by making it as simple as possible to encourage players to come up with their own codes by changing individual letters in existing ones. This really sold the device as a piece of black magic where you could take complete control of your game console and become a god finding all sorts of different cheats. This in turn made the Game Genie and indeed other devices like the Daytel Action Replay extremely popular. Many people would send their codes into magazines such as GamePro for others to try out and then they would alter their codes to see what they could achieve. The eight digit codes are very similar to the six digit codes, but they introduce an additional eight bit compare value that needs to be decoded as well. This compare value is used to check if a specific data value exists before that data value is applied. The compare byte is introduced because most NES cartridges use mappers to store much larger program data and without it would cause unintended issues because the game could be in the process of bank switching in data in and out of address space that the CPU can access. And the compare code looks like this. Once again, it's a variation on the address and data algorithms that we saw previously, but with a very similar bit shifting paradigm. The Game Genie was packaged with a booklet of codes, 
which could be used across various games. However, the booklet became outdated as Galoob and Codemasters developed new codes and new games were released. In response to this, Galoob created a paid subscription service where you'd subscribe and receive new code booklets every three months. Game Genie was a massive business, selling over 5 million cartridges, and by offering more codes for new games as a part of a subscription service, as you can imagine, Nintendo was not thrilled and attempted to get the whole thing shut down in court. Of course, as we know, they weren't successful. Game Genie and Action Replay were very popular cheat devices on many consoles. And with each iteration, there were new features. Many offered enhancements to the number of codes that could be entered. While the original NES Game Genie only supported three codes at one time, of course, these days with modern emulation, you can apply as many as you like. But it's an interesting look back at how this cartridge worked and how codes were generated. They most certainly weren't done at random. Daytel's Action Replay used a similar format on how they generated codes, but that device also did much more, and we'll cover that in a future episode. But for now, let me know your experiences with cheat devices like this. Were you around back in the day as of the Game Genie? Do you remember your favorite codes? Let me know them in the comments below. But for now, we're going to leave it here for today's episode. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, please don't forget to leave me a thumbs up, and I'll catch you guys in the next episode. Bye for now.